Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our grand rounds this morning. Uh, before I have the honor of introducing our uh, guest speaker today, some housekeeping items. Uh, the grand rounds is being webcasted live at on live stream, Facebook, and YouTube. So when you're asking questions, use the mic. Uh, and the webcast is always available after, so you can review it and learn more. I guess every time I talk to Naveen, I learn more. Uh, and uh, after the grand rounds at 9.45, there's a, the interview that I do with Naveen is going to be live casted also on these platforms. And you can go to that website, submit questions, and you know, we can have more time in that regard of interaction. Uh, there's a fellows forum this afternoon. Uh, uh, the fellows uh, will meet with the grand round speaker. Uh, and there's also, um, uh, there's also a translational discussion at from 11 to noon. Uh, it's going to be on Smith 14 with our translational lab, but anyone interested in translational research discussion uh, can join us. So it's an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Naveen Kapoor, who's our grand round speaker today. We had him here in 2016 when he talked about recovery. He's a kind of a multifaceted individual in my mind who's got a breadth of work and expertise. And in fact, when he comes, he probably needs to give like three or four talks to capture his, his breadth of expertise. Uh, last time, <clears throat> we couldn't get him to talk about a lot of the STEMI work that he's doing. So I'm excited he agreed to come back. Um, you know, he's the he's associate professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. He's a director of, uh, of four different programs, the Molecular Cardiology Research Institute, Cardiac Biology Research Center, Interventional Research Lab, and an acute MCS program that he runs. And they all exist. It's not just titles. I've been there. He's got a remarkable enterprise and, and work that he's built and done. Um, he's also devised some new technologies that are in study, safety, feasibility. He's the executive director of the CV Center for Research and Innovation. And beyond his research and mentorship, he's also measured by the numerous awards his mentees have gotten. And he's got a lot of postdocs, research fellows. He's dual border interventional and heart failure. And I think he had the first heart failure interventional research fellowship that, uh, in the country with a cross-training uh, uh, concept between interventional and heart failure. Uh, he's uh, <clears throat> he's has two auto ones working in uh, areas of recovery, and he's uh, has a publication on a new uh, novel molecule of endoglin, and and again he can talk about cardiac fibrosis on one well and do pressure volume loops. I can probably spend an hour talking about him, but the most important thing that happened yesterday, which I have not seen ever before with grand round speaker, is. We had a cardiologist in town who came all the way just to meet him because he trained in Detroit and he confessed that Naveen is his man crush. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first for me. Um, so thank you, Naveen, for, for being here. And today he's going to talk about in what in my mind is kind of a groundbreaking paradigm shift in STEMI care, uh, which if he, if he succeeds in the big trial, I think we'll change the landscape of how we treat uh, uh, STEMI patients. But no further ado, Naveen, thank you. Great, thanks, Arvind. I won't uh, describe my man crush. Uh, you know, I won't, I won't make you blush or embarrass you. Um, so thanks very much for having me here today. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. I was here in 2016 and had a great time engaging with your teams. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the Door to Unload trial and some of the rationale and mechanistic work that's led up, that has led up to the trial development. So I first wanted to just acknowledge, you know, how much of an honor it is to be here. And in fact, a lot of the pioneering work uh, that we're going to talk about today and this term disruptive trials, et cetera, is really built on a lot of the work that has been done and all of the disruptive concepts that were developed actually here in this area as well. And I think Michael DeBakey is one example of those pioneering 
uh, outside the box thinkers who really helped us start to think beyond vasculature into the ventricle and then onto device development and this interaction between hemodynamics, mechanical devices, and also the biology of these entire systems. So it's an absolute honor to be here uh, in this institution and talking about some of the work today. So I'd like to start with this video because, you know, this is the 50th year. It's the anniversary of Apollo 11. And, you know, I find myself reading more and more literature from the 1960s and 1970s these days. And this was an amazing time, you know, in the late 1960s for actually all of science. And, you know, this launch of uh, Apollo 11 really set the stage for everyone just imagining all the possibilities that could change the course of human history and improve outcomes, outcomes for all of humankind. And I think this is, um, this is really important because a lot of what I'm going to be talking about actually originated in the 1960s, some of the concepts. Now, this is a, a, a photograph of Howard Burchell, who was the editor of Circulation from 1965 to 1971. And I put this slide up here mostly for the fellows in training because, you know, Howard Burchell in, his, in the homage uh, editorial as he uh, resigned his position as circ editor, they identified that one of the things that he did so well was link pathology, physiology, basic science, and clinical cardiology. And that triple or quadruple threat that we often hear about, you know, this was actually in the 1960s and 1970s, sort of the, the gold standard for the uh, penultimate uh, clinician scientist. And as part of that wave of we can do anything and we can do better, Circulation at that time was publishing some really pioneering work. This is the January 1971 issue. And in this issue was this publication uh, from Morocco uh, and uh, Brunwald. And this was one of the first preclinical studies where they started to test the concept of reducing infarct size by actually reducing the workload of the myocardium. And so in these dog studies, they would do an LED occlusion or LED ligation, and then they would give the only device or drug that they had at that time which could actually unload or rest the heart, which was propranolol. And they found that if you could actually slow heart rate, uh, that you could actually reduce the size of the infarct, irrespective of the fact that the LED was occluded. And the final statement in this uh, report was that this, the findings suggest that measures designed for the reduction of myocardial oxygen demand uh, and improvement of coronary perfusion, if affected promptly, might actually reduce the ultimate size of infarction. And so this was 1971. Now, for a long time, around the same time in parallel, there was a lot of supply side thinking when it comes to myocardial supply demand mismatch. And there's a long lineage of coronary revascularization in acute MI going all the way from Mason Soans and the first angiogram to, again, DeBakey and first coronary bypass. And then in, again, the 1970s, where that paper from Brunwell is 1971, 1976, this guy was walking around the AHA, Andreas Grunzig, and showing a poster of pig data where he had an angioplasty balloon that could open up and restore myocardial oxygen supply uh, using a catheter-based approach. And of course, this was followed by the first balloon angioplasty in 1977. And so everything after that really started to focus on restoring oxygen supply. And the story that was being built by Brunwald in the 19, early 1970s, late 1960s around demand started to go by the wayside. And in fact, for AMI, it really became supply side thinking. And so we fast forward now to the modern era. And in the 2000s, there was very clear data that in STEMI, timing is everything. And time delayed to treatment and mortality, that relationship was very well established. And in fact, the word delay started to become a four-letter word if you're talking about STEMI. So every minute of delay was associated with increase in mortality at one year, increase in infarct size, increase in microvascular obstruction, suggesting that the transmurality of the infarct was actually more severe with every minute of delay. So the data suggested that for every 30 minutes of delay in ischemic time, meaning symptom onset to reperfusion, is associated with a 7.5% increase in one-year mortality and a 30% increase in infarct size. Now, if we go to 2019, and we've had a lot of uh, systems put into place for rapid STEMI treatment, there are some important facts to remember about AMI in the contemporary era. Every 40 seconds, an American will have a, my a myocardial infarction. And the estimated annual incidence for new MI is still 650,000%. Estimated average number of years of life lost because of an MI, despite all the therapies we have, is still 16.2 years for an MI. And 35% of people who have a coronary event 
in a given year will die as a result of it. So these are still sobering numbers in the field of MI. I don't think we're done yet as it relates to myocardial infarction and optimizing outcomes for these patients. So a lot has been done uh, for systems of care, and I put this slide up really to just emphasize the concept of ischemic time, which we're going to be talking about. And this is going from symptom onset to reperfusion. That's the total ischemic time or ischemic burden that one might, ex one might experience with a STEMI. And of course, the focus here is that time is muscle. So the systems are there to get patients from first medical contact to reperfusion as quickly as possible. Now, the AHA Mission Lifeline uh, was initiated also in, uh, the early, in the 2000s and also showed that there was a reduction in in-hospital mortality among patients with acute MI without cardiac arrest. Now, if you have cardiac arrest, you can see that the changes fall on the line of unity. But actually, excluding cardiac arrest, there was an improvement in outcomes as we start to get better at the systems approach uh, for uh, myocardial infarction. So in-hospital mortality is not so much the target. But when we think about determinants of damage during a heart attack, I think, again, this is that idea of changing the way we think a little bit back to the 1970s from supply uh, only to supply and demand. So all of the things here in red are things that would increase myocardial oxygen demand. So heart rate, wall stress, pressure inside the ventricle, stroke work, for example. And anything that increases any, any of the variables in red is, uh, is a variable that will increase ventricular load. So an increase in myocardial oxygen consumption correlating with increase in ventricular load. And most of the focus right now, as we've talked about, has been on uh, reducing ischemic injury. Now, we also know that ventricular wall stress promotes maladaptive remodeling, and this is a thing that's very well known to Arvin and the heart failure transplant teams, is that the primary target of heart failure therapy is to reduce load. It's to reduce wall stress. And this is simply the law of Laplace suggesting that reducing uh, ventricular pressure and volume, uh, you may start to change that maladaptive remodeling signaling pathways. Now, this paper came out uh, in 2012, and this is from Doug Mann, and I think this is a really nice report. What he summarizes here is this concept of ductile deformation of a material. And if you start to look at this sort of um, elastic and plastic region slope, as you start to get something, a ventricle that starts to dilate and you reach this plastic region, this is a region of irreversible damage. And so this might be your dilated, thinned out ventricle where you may not actually be able to recover uh, completely this ventricle. But in this early phase of the elastic region, there is a reversibility to the damage. And in fact, this is the point where we think we can start to focus on myocardial recovery. And this is most relevant for patients with acute MI as opposed to dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, if we're going to do that, though, one of the things that's important to understand about this relationship is that this actually fits on the pathway of pressure and volume inside the ventricle. So the way to go from here to here in terms of reversing damage is to reduce pressure and volume inside the ventricle, targeting that law of Laplace and that wall stress. So when we think about ventricular load, this is also not a new disruptive concept, and this actually goes all the way back to the 1800s, but in the uh, 1990s and 2000s, these group of investigators actually started to develop a real fundamental understanding of the biology of ventricular load and translating pressure and volume into, uh, into actual uh, myocardial biology. And in 1975, again the 1970s, with this was one of the first papers establishing something known as the pressure volume area, which essentially correlates with myocardial oxygen consumption and is an estimate of the workload of the myocardium. And if you break apart the uh, pressure volume area, a substantial portion of that oxygen consumption is due to cross-bridge cycling in myocytes, it's due to excitation contraction coupling. And then there's another component linked to basal metabolism. And if we fast forward now 40 years later, we're still actually working on the same operating principles of pressure volume area correlating with mechanical work, calcium signaling, and basal metabolism. So if we, be, if we believe that ventricular unloading can actually reduce oxygen consumption, we have to show that it reduces work, calcium cycling, and basal metabolism. So if we go now to the modern era, and this is where our lab for the past uh, decade or so has been focusing on mechanical support devices, what we see here is actually one of the first pressure volume loops with the uh, impella transvalvular pump, showing actually that with device activation, there's a significant reduction in LV volume as well as LV pressure. And in fact, as we start to get towards the end of this pressure volume loop, this uh, video, 
the pressure volume area comes down, but more importantly, actually, the shape of the pressure volume loop now takes on a triangular shape. And you actually lose those isovolumic contraction and relaxation phases of the typical square wave pressure volume loop. And when you see this triangular shape, that means that you've now actually taken away some of the most uh, energy consuming components of the pressure volume curve, which is isovolumic contraction and relaxation. And this is a representation of the unloaded ventricle hemodynamically. Now the question though is, how do you translate that into clinical data? So does load actually portend poor outcomes in STEMI? And there is data that's been published now and actually continues to be published. And these are some of the earliest papers showing that a patient who comes in with STEMI who has an LVEDP greater than 18, this is associated with an increased incidence of heart failure and an increase actually also in infarct size. And more recently, we've also seen that for patients who come in with STEMI who have an LVEDP greater than 24, this is actually associated with increased mortality. And this signal is occurring within that acute hospitalization within the first month, but extends all the way out to two years. So patients who come in with STEMI who are loaded, meaning that they have high filling pressures inside the ventricle, these are the patients who actually have a worse prognosis in STEMI. And we also know, this is from the Sweetheart study, that patients who develop heart failure in the setting of MI, especially in acute MI, and in-hospital heart failure development, these folks also have a higher cumulative probability of death uh, over the ensuing years. So the development of heart failure after acute MI actually remains a major problem that has major uh, prognostic implications. These are data from Olmsted County, also showing that for patients who developed heart failure in acute MI had lower survival compared to patients who did not develop heart failure in the hospital. So one of the questions is, why do we need a trial in STEMI? We've shown that Mission Lifeline can reduce uh, in-hospital mortality, that those numbers are going in the correct direction if you exclude cardiac arrest. But what we're seeing actually is that we are now trading in-hospital mortality and AMI for subsequent development of heart failure. And this is a study that came out in 2016, looking at over 2,600 patients, which basically establishes the fact that infarct size matters, and actually that larger infarcts drive mortality and subsequent development of heart failure. If you look at in the primary PCI population, even in the contemporary era, about 18% of total LV mass remains infarcted after an MI. And that's irrespective of the territory at risk. But for every 5% increase in myocardial infarct size, the one-year risk of, uh, of mortality goes up by 19% and heart failure hospitalization by 20%. So there's still a significant correlation and the infarct size uh, still remains a primary target of therapy for which we do not have a great answer other than more rapid uh, reperfusion. And we are seeing that even more rapid door-to-balloon times, as the interventionalists know in this community, uh, does not really change the dial in terms of infarct size below 90 minutes. So I think one of the challenges, though, of course, is when you're dealing with a paradox. And so the paradox of reperfusion in acute MI is that reperfusion therapy, which is designed to limit myocardial damage in STEMI, may itself actually promote myocardial damage. And when you say something like that, it's a very difficult thing for people to swallow. And in fact, when I Googled paradox to find an image of paradox, this thing popped up. And at first, when I looked at this thing, I was like, well, what is that? But the more I looked at it, the more frustrated I got because I couldn't figure out where it began and where it ended. And so then I understood that paradoxes are actually very frustrating. And when you go through the seven stages of transitional change and you're introducing a paradox uh, or a change in practice, there are actually a number of things that require transition. And I think ultimately we're at this point where we're focusing primarily on testing. And is it true that reperfusion injury exists? And is it a target of therapy? And is it true that if we can reduce infarct size that patients will have better outcomes? Now, current approaches to reduce reperfusion injury have really focused on that aspect of ischemia reperfusion injury. They haven't focused on reducing ischemic damage. The assumption has been that the best way to reduce ischemic injury is to open the artery as quickly as possible and then deal with the consequences of reperfusion injury. So if you have ischemia without reperfusion, you can assume that 100% of the air at risk becomes infarcted. If you have timely reperfusion, that is reduced by 50%, a substantial reduction in what otherwise might have happened. But as we start to look into the field of cardioprotection, the holy grail has been trying to reduce infarct size even further on top of timely reperfusion and get these infarct sizes down as small as possible uh, for patients who can come in with, uh, come in with STEMI.
And when we look at the, uh, if we take a closer look at the mechanisms of ischemia reperfusion injury, they actually all begin to focus on metabolism and they also focus on mitochondrial function. So here are those same components. So metabolism, calcium handling, and also mitochondrial function. And when we reperfuse, there's actually a fast forward mechanism where we trigger more myocyte death by actually causing more mitochondrial disruption, mitochondrial death. And all of the potential cardioprotective strategies have focused primarily at this point, which is to reduce reperfusion injury as opposed to attenuating ischemic injury. Now, since the 1970s is the focus of the talk today, back in 1978 was one of the first studies looking at the concept of mechanical unloading as a way to reduce infarct size. And this began with the intraaortic balloon pump. And since then, over the past 40 years, there's been a large focus on LV unloading in terms of whether or not this can be applied acutely to, again, reduce ventricular wall stress, reduce maladaptive signaling pathways, and, of course, reduce infarct size. And what we've learned over the past uh, decade or so is that you have to have adequate LV unloading, and it has to be applied before, not after, reperfusion. And that's what's required to essentially reduce infarct size. And that's the amalgamation of 40 years of science in this space. And the first trial to attempt to answer this question was the CRISP-AMI trial. So based on some of the preclinical data with IABP, the idea was pre-reperfusion IABP in anterior MI without cardiogenic shock, trying to see if they can reduce infarct size. And in fact, what was learned was actually that with IABP introduction, there was a slight trend towards increase infarct size. And it's important to understand that they were looking at infarct size as a percent of total left ventricular mass, not just the area at risk. And in fact, these infarct sizes are quite large. They're around 39% of the ventricle is demonstrating infarct at that three to five day MRI. So CRISP AMI showed that IABP probably not sufficient to reduce infarct size. And we, around uh, the late 2000, uh, we were also beginning to work with tandem heart and Tandem Heart was one of the first LAFA bypass systems. This was something that actually had been studied again in the 1980s with John Lashinger and a number of other scientists in the surgical arena, the idea of LAFA bypass to unload the ventricle. With the Tandem device, we could now do this percutaneously. And when we did this preclinical study, we compared ischemia reperfusion alone versus ischemia with ventricular unloading using the Tandem LA uh, reduction device and reperfusion, and this is that ILV unloading concept. And in the study design, we actually built in a 30-minute delay to reperfusion. There's that four-letter word, because we knew that by the time you put in a tandem and you shift over to take care of the coronary aspect, there's going to be some inherent delay. So we wanted to make sure that we account for that uh, in this translational study. And what we learned was that you, when we activate the tandem device, we were seeing a nice reduction in ventricular stroke work by about 50, 60%. And this was associated with about a 50% reduction in infarct size. And that was despite the 30 minute delay. So the ischemic time in the preclinical model actually had about 150 minutes versus 120 minutes. And remember, we should be seeing about a 30% increase in the infarct size with that 30 minute delay. So this introduced the idea that prioritizing therapy to first managing the ventricle and then reperfusing may actually maximize the amount of myocardial salvage we could achieve. And if you think about what happens in operating rooms around the world, that's really the first thing that happens with a STEMI patient that comes in to the OR, is they put them on pump. And you start to manage the ventricle, and then you start to deal with the coronary aspects of reperfusion. Now, the first attempt of the primary unloading trial was also shown here with the tandem device, and this was the TRIST trial. But this had zero enrollment, and probably appropriately so. The idea of putting a transeptal puncture, a 21 French cannula into the left atrium in the middle of a STEMI with all of that anticoagulant and antiplatelet on board, just technically not feasible. And that's an engineering limitation. So around that time, uh, Impella had developed the CP device which could generate about 3.5 liters per minute of flow with a single stick, a single arterial access. And the question was, does this also reduce infarct size since we know that it reduces ventricular wall stress? Now, when we designed this translational study, we put the burden of proof on the Impella device by actually extending the delay time by 60 minutes instead of 30 minutes. So again, in the treatment arm, it's 150 minutes of total ischemic time compared to 90 minutes 
of total ischemic time in the control arm. So we should be seeing, again, bigger infarct if the primary driver of infarct size is LED occlusion. And in fact, what we saw, again, was very similar to the tandem study, which was a 50% reduction in the infarct size with a significant reduction in wall stress. Again, showing that linear slope here that was uh, illustrated by Doug Mann in his review article of that myocardial recovery slope in that elastic region. So reducing pressure and volume seem to correlate with a reduction in infarct size, but more importantly, the ischemic time was now beginning to change its definition. And in fact, you could have an LED occlusion that went on for 150 minutes and have lower infarct size compared to an LED occlusion that only was there for 90 minutes. And that's, the, that's one of the early concepts of the disruptive aspect of primary unloading. So since 2012, there have been a number of studies, and we've taken a deep dive into mechanistic biology. The last thing I wanted to do with my career is start to chase uh, a shadow and make sure that we wanted to know, is this actually real? Are we actually seeing some biology here? Uh, and the best way to do that is to use an unbiased approach at the data analysis. So what we did was we actually first sent out all of our infarct samples to a separate laboratory in blinded manner and had them run a transcriptomics analysis on the infarct gene array. And what they came back with was that the gene array was able to segregate out which, which samples were actually with primary reperfusion and which were primary unloading based on the heat map. And in fact, the primary unloading heat map starts to look much more like an uninjured uh, myocardium as opposed to primary reperfusion alone, which really starts to show the gene shift. And when we looked more specifically at some of the signaling pathways, the signaling pathways that are best known are related to things like stromal-derived factor 1 alpha, GSK3 beta. These are canonical pathways of cardioprotective salvage. And these were all operative and, in fact, increased in the unloaded samples compared to the non-unloaded samples. But remember, at the end of the day, it came down to the mitochondria, right? So the first thing that happens when you become ischemic is the mitochondria become dysfunctional. And just looking at some of the EMs from these infarct sizes, we could see that these are normal mitochondria. In the primary reperfusion arm, we were seeing swollen and ruptured mitochondria. But with the unloaded arm, they were again looking intact. So there's something about mitochondrial structure uh, and functional integrity that seems to be setting the stage for myocardial recovery. If you lose the mitochondria, it's unlikely that the myocyte will recover. And actually, this is a replication of our work, but the original paper that showed this concept was from Richard Smalling, where he published the first mitochondrial uh, images of reperfusion with and without unloading uh, using the hemopump. Now, one of the questions that always comes up, and we had the same question in our clinical practice, we do a lot of pumps, was can we do the same thing with ECMO? And so we started to, we designed this study where we did the door to unload study, but this time we did it by initiating ECMO before reperfusion and waiting 30 minutes. And in fact, we found that actually ECMO started to increase the infarct size. And one assumption is that that might be related to the ventricular load. But even independent of the load, we found that there's something else about ECMO that may be triggering. And one of it may be neutrophil activation. And the primary cell that's responsible for infarct reperfusion injury is the neutrophil. And these neutrophils get activated once you're in the ECMO circuit. And that may be actually the explanation for this increase in infarct size with ECMO. Now, when we start to look a little bit deeper at some of the mechanisms, one of the other questions that came out is, are we actually changing microcirculatory perfusion of the myocardium when we're unloaded? And so if you think about your VAD patients who have multivessel disease, it's extremely rare. In fact, it's, it's probably case reportable where we would do bypass on a patient at the time of LVAD surgery. And in fact, once a patient's on LVAD, we're less concerned about all of the multivessel disease that that patient experiences. And the only time that rears its ugly head is if the LVAD were to thrombose or if there's a problem with the LVAD and they start to develop chest pain again. So very similarly, when we start to activate transvalvular unloading, we were seeing that actually the flow through collateral vessels into the area at risk was actually increasing. And so even with an occluded LAD artery, where you would expect very little perfusion pressure down here in that area at risk, as soon as we activated the pump, the perfusion pressure in the distal bed started to increase. And what this tells us actually is that this change in the collateral flow index actually correlated with the reduction in LV stroke work. The red circles here are the unloaded hearts compared to sham, compared to ECMO. And in fact, the increase in collateral flow also correlated with a reduction in infarct size. 
So one of the possibilities actually is that by unloading, we are actually increasing microcirculatory flow and reducing the area at risk. So that when you reperfuse, let's say it's a fixed amount of reperfusion injury, it's instead of being 50% of this area at risk, it's 50% of this area at risk. And that may explain some of the infarct reduction is just by reducing the area at risk. And it's possible that unloading may actually terminate the ischemic injury as opposed to just reperfusion injury. Because if you're increasing microcirculatory flow, then you may actually be increasing perfusion without epicardial reperfusion. And that's that concept of, um, again, primary unloading as opposed to primary reperfusion. Now, one of the things, if you think about just the um, biology of ischemia reperfusion injury, one of the first things that happens when myocardium becomes ischemic is there's a shift in underlying metabolism, and especially substrate utilization for energy production. And under healthy conditions, we use this amount of fatty acids and this amount of glucose. But with ischemic conditions, this is the shift it actually reverses uh, when you start to have ischemic myocardium. And so one of the questions is, is this happening again in our, uh, in, our, in our experimental designs? And the way to answer this, again, I wanted this to be an unbiased approach. So we sent our samples over to Metabolon, where again, they were blinded, and they did a metabolomics heat map and generated the data. And what you can see here is the sham, the reperfusion, and the impella unloaded before reperfusion. And once again, the heat map starts to suggest that this group starts to look more like uninjured myocardium. And the light blue here is actually all of the metabolites related to energy substrate utilization. So when we look in more detail at the data, what we found actually was that glycolysis was still intact. And in fact, the TCA cycle was still intact if you were unloaded as opposed to just having primary reperfusion. So what this means is that your myocytes are still functionally intact. The mitochondria, all of the substrate for mitochondrial function also remains intact if you're unloaded, despite having a longer ischemic time. Now, that's where we uh, started to design this concept of unloading causing a metabolic shift in the myocardium. And what this means is now we've started to uncouple ischemia from reperfusion. So for the first time in medicine, it may be possible to have an ischemic patient come in, render them non-ischemic while leaving the artery occluded, and then subsequently reperfuse the artery when it's safe to do so. And this uncoupling of ischemic versus reperfusion injury in the cath lab is really that paradigm change that we're introducing is that you may actually create a window in time where you could start to do many other things uh, to improve the patient's outcome. Now, this is a, an illustration of just how mitochondria work, and I'll just show this very briefly. But cardiomyocyte survival really depends on a pump that sits on your inner mitochondrial membrane. And this is a proton motive flow pump. It works because of a gradient here across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And when you become ischemic, or if a patient were to become ischemic, what happens is this gradient disappears because this ATP synthase enzyme is very sensitive to ischemia. And when the gradient disappears, no longer is the pump active, and as a result, you're no longer generating ATP. And so the energy production in the cell starts to go away, and the cell will die. Now, to maintain this gradient across the intermitochondrial membrane, there's the electron transport complex. And so these are a series of complexes where their primary focus is to, is to pump uh, electrons back across the membrane and to maintain the gradient so that they can come back across with ATP synthase and generate energy. Now, when you look more closely, it actually turns out that in particular, of all of the complexes, complex one is the one that's primarily involved in maintaining a significant portion of that gradient and allowing for proton motive flow. So if we were to try to understand whether or not any intervention, drug or device, were to attenuate ischemic injury, the way to answer the question in the most proximal event of ischemic injury would be to look at the status of complex one. And if complex one is dysfunctional, then you are on the way to ischemic injury. And so the question is, what is the status of complex one in the unloaded versus loaded condition in AMI? So we conducted that study, again, using our infarct models with a delayed reperfusion uh, compared to primary reperfusion. So reperfusion alone, impella before reperfusion, and VA ECMO before reperfusion. 
And what we saw here, this is actually something called a seahorse analysis, looking at multiple complexes by providing substrate for each of the complexes. And I'll take you down to the bar graph. So in primary reperfusion, complex one was shut down in the infarct zone compared to the non-infarct zone. And that's what we'd expect, is that the first sign of ischemic injury is there, complex one is down. If you unload before reperfusion, complex one actually has the same level of functionality in the infarct and in the non-infarct zone. So there's no difference. So complex one still remains intact. And if you activate ECMO, all of a sudden we were seeing that complex one, complex two, and complex three were now becoming dysfunctional. So we're having a more broader effect on the electron transport chain, suggesting that if you can unload, that there may be something specific about that ischemic injury as opposed to just reperfusion injury. Now, when complex one becomes ischemic, what happens is the complex actually becomes deactivated. And the issue here is it's almost like a loaded gun. So let's say you have a, a gun and you're loading bullets into it and the, the bullets keep coming out on the other end of the gun. But when you render the gun uh, deactivated and you're still loading bullets into it, when you reactivate with reperfusion, what happens is all those bullets come out. And so what happens with reperfusion is that the complex one that's been deactivated by ischemia becomes reactivated and the release of all the bullets, the bullets are reactive oxygen species. And that's how you create this massive reperfusion injury that occurs. So the question then is, what is the status of the deactivation of complex one? And does this promote oxidative stress? And can you attenuate that by just unloading the ventricle? And so when we look at the amount of active versus deactivated complex one, in the immediate reperfusion arm, we saw about a threefold increase in the amount of deactivated complex one. But if you unload, before the reperfusion, it actually stays in the same configuration as uninjured myocardium, suggesting that we are preventing the deactivation of complex one by reducing that ischemic burden. And more specifically, when we look at that reactive oxygen species generation, with reperfusion, this goes up substantially. And then if you're unloaded, there's again that attenuation of ROS damage, which is occurring uh, with reperfusion, but not if you're on the platform of unloading. Now, one of the ultimate questions is, so what? And my kids ask me this all the time when I talk about my science. But the ultimate question is, does this actually set the stage for recovery? So you reduce mitochondrial complexes and you do all sorts of great biology. But at the end of the day, does the ventricle recover or not? And so this was the study we published in 2018 where we looked 30 days later in these pig models. And what we found was that by LGE uh, imaging with CMR, or by anatomic path, the scar burden was reduced in the unloaded arm compared to reperfusion. But more importantly, the myocardial function was actually recovering in these hearts compared to these hearts in the 30-day follow-up. So suggesting that you are allowing that set, the setting the stage for recovery. Now, some of the latest data coming out of the lab is we showed you 30-minute delay, we showed you 60-minute delay, and we finally said, let's just jump into the water completely. What if we don't reperfuse? And what if we just look at 100 or 210 minutes of LED occlusion time and with the last 120 minutes of it being unloaded? And what we were trying to figure out is, if you got rid of reperfusion, are you still getting a protective effect during the ischemic phase without the reperfusion phase? And what we found here was that if you're unloaded, if, well, if you're not unloaded, just having ischemia starts to increase that infarct to area at risk just by having the ischemia. But if you're unloaded, you're already seeing a shutdown of that ischemic injury, even without the reperfusion component. When you reperfuse after 210 minutes, all of a sudden in the control arm, that uh, infarct size starts to go up by about fourfold. And so there's that increase in the infarct size due to reperfusion injury. And even in the unloaded arm, you do see the infarct size increase. So there is still that reperfusion injury, but to a lesser degree. And that may be related to that area at risk mechanism, but it's probably related to the fact that delayed reperfusion with unloading is actually attenuating the ischemic injury. So the concept is that if you're unloaded and you have delayed reperfusion, it doesn't mean that you're delaying treatment. What we're doing is we're changing the type of anti-ischemic strategy from a epicardial reperfusion approach to a ventricular focused myocardial unloading approach. And that just hasn't been done in the cath lab uh, you know, to date.
Now, when we look at all of the biology, it all is consistent, showing that, again, the complexes are consistent, ATP production is better with the unloaded state, and the ROS, or oxidative stress, is also lower in the unloaded state after the reperfusion. Now, one of the things about all this great science and biology is, can you actually translate this into a clinical study? And in order to go from all the design thinking and the innovation, that's all great. But actually, to execute this in clinical arenas, we have to cross a gap. And the first gap is, is it safe to do this? And the second gap is, is it feasible to do this? Can you actually do this in patients? The third is, will operators actually comply with this concept of standing by with an occluded artery and unloading? And then the fourth is, what are all the things you have to learn to optimize performance of a clinical trial before embarking on a massive clinical trial? So I actually thought that the best example of a pilot trial was from SpaceX. So you saw Apollo 11, and actually if you follow SpaceX, they get a lot of crap thrown at them in the media. And finally, they said, you know what? We'll just do a pilot trial. We'll do an unmanned landing of, an, of a uh, rocket, but let's do it on a floating platform in the middle of the ocean. And that's how you perform a disruptive pilot trial. And the purpose of this pilot trial, after they had failed several times, was to learn all the things to fill in the gap. Is it safe? Is it feasible? How do you optimize performance, et cetera? So I think that's one of the best examples of a pilot trial. So we decided to do the same thing in the door to unload concept. And we ran this pilot study, and the study design was simply to answer the question, is it safe and is it feasible to put an impella in, in an anterior MI, and then ask operators to do that first, and then in a, in a subgroup of that total group, ask that group to wait 30 minutes before reperfusion. And so the concept that we're still operating on is time is muscle. You can't waste time. So anterior STEMI comes in, referred for primary PCI, ECG confirmation, informed consent, enrollment, prep, drape, anticoagulate, antiplatelet, ultrasound guided access, vascular angiogram, left ventricular gram, 14 French sheath insertion, and then randomize to unload an immediate or unload and delay, put the impella in, activate it, go straight to PCI, or have 30 minutes of unloading therapy, and then go to PCI. Leave the pump in for a minimum of three hours, and then explant safely. So that's a lot to ask in a pilot, and so I think it was important to do that, to confirm that we could do that. So we had successful enrollment of the trial, 50 patients, across 15 centers in the United States, with a nice distribution of cases. So they weren't all being done at one or two centers that just had a lot of experience with the technology. What we saw actually, and I'll give you an illustration of a case first. This is a 50 year old who came into our center, anterior STEMI, less than six hours of chest pain. And case start is 937, angiogram, V-gram, impella in. And in our group, 937 to 946 was the amount of time to get the device in safely, about nine minutes and now you're unloaded. And now this patient gets randomized to the 30 minute delay arm. And this was a completely new experience. LED is occluded, pump is in, and we are watching the patient to make sure they're okay. And you know, one of the things that actually I think helped operators was to not look at the LED artery, but was to look at the patient. And in fact, this patient came in with a heart rate of 115 and LVEDP of about 25. And after, during the 30 minutes, as a heart failure doc, I needed to tr start treating the guy. So we put him on the pump, and now we give him a little bit of nitro because he was hypertensive initially. Uh, he's off BiPAP, he's pain-free, heart rate's now 68 after five of metoprolol, and his LVDP now is about 10. Nice square root sign on the LV tracing, minimal pulse amplitude on the aortic tracing. He's unloaded. But more importantly, the patient at this point said, did you get it? And I said, did I get what? I said, well, did you open the artery? I said, no, we've just put you on a pump. And he says, okay. I said, why are you asking? He says, well, because I feel better. And I said, okay, that, thank you, because I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> and, so, and so that I think is really important because that experience was replicated across 50 patients in 15 centers. And the most important thing we learned is not that you can open an artery, but is that you could change your approach to these patients especially if anterior MI, patients coming in who will have a high LVEDP, you saw the prognostic implications of that, and you can focus on the ventricle 
and then reperfuse. And when we looked at the timing metrics, the team here in the cath lab uh, Tufts has gotten really good at this. It was 67.48 minutes for door to balloon time. That's inclusive of the 30 minute delay. And so this can be done. It can be done safely and feasibly across centers. The most important finding for me from the pilot trial was that we had 100% compliance with the 30 minute delay. At any moment, operators were allowed to bail out and treat the patient as they felt was needed. And the fact that across centers that we had everybody stand by for 30 minutes tells me that even anecdotally, these patients are stabilizing once they're on pump. And that I think is really important. It's one of the first signs of safety and potentially acute efficacy is to have that 34 minutes as opposed to 11 minutes on pump uh, to suggest that you can do this study. Now, when we look at the data from the trial, the majority of these patients had ST sum elevation greater than six millimeters. So these are large anterior MIs. We also saw that the average LVEDP in both arms was well over 20, about 24 and 25. These are not your small MIs. These are those ones that you saw in the paper suggesting high mortality and high recurrence of heart failure hospitalization. What I think is really important is that in most STEMI studies, you'll see about a 10 to 20% no refill rate, especially in anterior MI. And remember that study with the collateral flow index, we saw that actually there were zero patients with no reflow after PCI, suggesting that just by unloading the myocardium, microcirculatory flow is changing and potentially improving. And if you think about flow dynamics and autoregulation and ischemic uncoupling of autoregulation, if you're now rendering the myocardium non-ischemic by putting them on a pump, all of a sudden those coronary microcirculatory flow dynamics change. We saw that there were very little, uh, very few MACE events. 30-day MACE was two patients, one patient. Total composite of 30-day MACE events. Again, we had two vascular events. And I thought actually the vascular events would occur at the time of implant, when there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of adrenaline surging. This was actually a really important part of the pilot. We learned that actually 15 centers have 15 different ways of taking an impella out. And in fact, these two vascular AEs were related to an up and over uh, approach for dry balloon closure of the impella, which was probably unnecessary, and there are better ways to deal with that. So this will, this really was an important uh, informative signal that we'll deal with going forward. At the AHA, when we presented the late-breaking study, uh, Holger Thiele presented a, a phenomenal um, editorial where he looked at total ischemic time. And remember, in the old era, and I'll use that term uh, lightly, ischemic time was symptom onset to PCI. And what we're suggesting actually is that ischemia actually stops as soon as you're unloaded. So if you were to look at a symptom onset to PCI time, the two arms had 210 minutes, no difference in total ischemic burden. But actually this group with the delay arm was unloaded earlier by random chance. And so ischemia would stop here. And so when we look at that concept, the infarct sizes in both arms of the pilot were around the 10 to 15% range. And when we compare that to the historic control of the CRISP AMI trial, which was around 38%, this gave us that early signal that we might be on the right trajectory to reducing infarct size. And if you look across studies, the average across multiple studies is around 20 to 25%. And CRISP AMI is probably one of the larger ones. So even with a 20 to 25%, we are seeing that reduction. And remember, for every 5% decrease in infarct size, 20% reduction in one-year mortality and one-year heart failure hospitalization. Now, this is another thing we learned about the pilot. If you look closely at the scatter plots, this is the unload and immediate. This is the unload and delay arm. And you notice two dots here that are sitting on the zero infarct zone. So these patients, for whatever reason, with large anterior MI, had zero infarct. And when you look more closely, one of them was a Brugada patient who basically had a misread ECG. And the other patient actually had a Takotsubo. And so when you eliminate those patients from the analysis, all of a sudden, the data starts to suggest that the delay arm actually was trending towards statistical significance. But it's a small N number. You can't do that. But when I sit there and look at the data myself, I do that. And I think that's why, again, these are all, you know, um, uh, are provoking in terms of our thoughts. But at the ultimate, we have to prove this in a pivotal trial. But when we look across the aggregate of all the data, one of the other signals that we saw was that as the ST sum increases, and you're talking about increasing severity of MI, uh, 
the unload and immediate arm continued to have higher infarct to area at risk, whereas the unload and delayed arm has a very flat response, no matter how big the MI is. And in fact, in the patients with the largest MIs, we saw that there was a statistically significant reduction in the infarct size to area at risk. Even in a small pilot, a p-value of 0.04 was unexpected for a safety feasibility study. Now, when we look at ischemic time in that cohort of the largest MIs, it turns out that actually compared to the unload and immediate arm, there was an additional 60 minutes of total ischemic time in the group that had unload and delay. But this was also the group that had that significant reduction in infarct size. So again, it starts to suggest that our terminology of ischemic time and infarct correlation starts to shift. We should have seen a significant increase in the infarct size with an additional 60-minute burden of ischemic time. But in fact, we saw that the curve was going in this direction. And that suggests that paradigm shift in the ischemic infarct to ischemic time curve. So the STEMI DTU pivotal trial is now launching. Uh, and this study will now replicate the patient population, anterior STEMI. But this time, we will randomize to uh, unloading and 30-minute delay based on the early signal of the delay efficacy and compare that to door-to-balloon, which is just reperfusion alone in large anterior MI. And so I think actually this study is really primarily testing two anti-ischemic strategies as opposed to a reperfusion protection strategy. And so we believe that this neither group will have a delay in treatment, but in fact, it's just using two different approaches to shut down ischemia. Now, one of the things that we learned a lot about was infarct uh, size trials and looking at MRI readouts. And I'll just point out the fact that when we look more specifically at the translational aspect of the study, these were the pig slices, these were the human MRIs. This was the pig data, again, looking at 15 and 30 minutes of unloading and it actually overlaps quite nicely. And when we look more specifically at microvascular obstruction from the clinical trial, the group with unload and delay had smaller amounts of microvascular obstruction compared to unload and immediate and compared to the CRISP-AMI uh, control cohort uh, without balloon pump. And mechanistically, I think it's important for folks to understand that the primary endpoint of the DTU pivotal trial will be infarct size normalized to total LV mass as opposed to area at risk. And part of the rationale for that, again, came from the mechanistic work showing that as soon as you're unloaded, we may be shrinking the area at risk. So if you're shrinking both infarct size and area at risk, the ratio of infarct size to area at risk may not change. So really looking at infarct size to total LV mass is important as the primary endpoint. And it's important for folks to understand that the trial is actually going to be one of the largest STEMI trials that's been conducted to date. We're looking at about over six to 700 patients in the trial. It is powered for the primary endpoint and for the composite of secondary efficacy endpoints. And if you look at the secondary efficacy endpoints, these are actually heart failure endpoints. Looking at heart failure hospitalization, ICD CRT implant, shock development, uh, as well as CV mortality. And the, sec the secondary safety endpoints also will focus on that vascular aspect of how do you manage these pumps and this technology. So with that, I'll end but pointing out the fact that with the STEMI door to unload concept, I think it's good for folks to understand that mechanistically, we believe that there's no delay to treatment in the, tr in the study, that actually treatment begins with LV unloading. And the goal, of course, is to take this patient that I saw in 2007 and then saw in the heart failure clinic for a number of years until he re resurfaced with dilated cardiomyopathy and cardiogenic shock 10 years later and actually shut down that entire pathway and get this patient to recovery and avert all of that advanced heart failure therapy. Sorry, Arvind. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to end, and thanks so much for your attention. Hi, Naveen. Uh, such a fascinating study. I, I, totally amazed with your pilot data. In, in that study, did you guys consider having just reperfusion only rather than immediate versus delayed? And what was the rationale of not including? And do you think if you would have done that, it would have informed more of your study design with the STEMI DTU? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's a, it's a common question. I think the, the desire would have been to have, you know, essentially the pivotal upfront, and people are excited.
about you know seeing some of these data. The purpose of the pilot was to was actually my selfish purpose was to convince myself that it's safe and feasible. I was less concerned about whether or not we're going to show a difference with door to balloon, but I needed to know that we could implant the device that we could delay, and how important is the delay? If we saw zero efficacy or any signal that there's any difference between delayed reperfusion and immediate, and they looked exactly the same across all the analyses, then the pivotal trial design would have changed substantially. And in fact, people would feel probably better about the idea of just unload and immediate. But I think part of the problem with the CRISP-AMI trial was that there was no pilot. There was no, there was no translational learning that was done. And in fact, they went straight to a pivotal and it was much easier to follow the old rule, which is open the artery as quickly as possible. And what we're suggesting again with the pilot was, is it safe, is it feasible? And now we're at the point where we'll start to have the control arm. But the purpose of the pilot was not to look for early signals of efficacy compared to standard therapy. So it's so an excellent presentation. I had a question like for the pivotal trial um, it's all anterior wall MI patients? It's Correct. Be, okay. So it's a patient comes with just at a practical level, a patient comes sure. with anterior wall MI, crushing chest pain. And uh, I get told that, you know, um, there's a standard of care approach and then there's this alternative approach. And I, I'm still having crushing chest pain. And um, it takes some time to understand the concept yes. of hemodynamic unloading at a layman level. And I, I would think that that would delay some time to consent a patient. I mean... I yeah. mean, unless, especially if someone's educated enough to understand these things, and yeah. how practically are you going to be able to do that? Yeah, I, it's, it's a and this was, this was actually one of the other reasons for the pilot, meaning that how do you actually consent a patient for the study? Yeah. And that was, again, something we learned a lot about in the pilot. We had 15 centers all going through their IRBs. You know, the Tufts IRB, you know, did an excellent job, and I think they were rigorous in their, um, in their analysis of this pilot study. And the informed consent process is one of the most important aspects of the trial. Now, the way we did the informed consent was we first of all had the language very clearly delineated on a laminated card, having all the elements that you need in the, in the trial consent. The second is that it's also important to remember these are not patients who are in cardiogenic shock. These are patients who are your typical 50-year-old person coming in, was at the gym working out, having some chest pain, even if they're having crushing chest pain, a lot of that is being managed in the emergency room and they're communicating, they understand what you're saying. The second aspect is now as we go into the pivotal, the fact that we have the pilot data in hand really starts to help because we can now say a pilot trial has been performed, it was safe, it was feasible. We saw an early sign of efficacy suggesting that patients who were enrolled in the pump arm may have benefit but we don't know that for sure, and then you can go through all the explanations. The fourth aspect of the informed consent is that it's important to remember that we're not testing a new technology. There have been over 100,000 impella implants worldwide, and so the technology is actually designed for much sicker patients, high-risk PCI, multivessel rota, cardiogenic shock. So on the scheme of things for which the device is FDA approved, we're actually on that, on that lower end because we're talking about an anterior STEMI in a patient who's not in shock, who, um, where the safety of the device has been well established. The question now is safety of the concept. And the pilot trial also helped to establish that so that now across 40 to 50 centers around the US, we can actually execute the pivotal. But that was another really important aspect was how do we do informed consent in a STEMI trial? Yeah. But remember, STEMI trials have been done for a long time. Uh, we're not new. It's not new, uh, you know, in terms of the concept. But very good question. Yeah. Enjoyed very much your presentation. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a it's a very nice progression from your basic science laboratory work to you know initiating a I think uh, very innovative and uh, trial that may push the envelope and how do you treat patients? The question to you is: What is optimization of unloading? Uh, how do you optimize that? How, uh, what are the guides for, for in your trial? And two, going back to the initial premise, besides the microvascular issue, how much reduction in stress are you doing in this unloading, at least in the pilot trial? Yeah, it's a great question. So what we, what we specifically learned in the pilot was that these are not hypotensive shock patients. 
These are actually hypertensive patients, a lot of them, normotensive. And putting a transvalvular axial flow pump into the milieu of hypertension doesn't really unload unless you start to do some other things. So I think that's where what we learned was that this is not a door to impella trial, but we actually have to unload. And so on the platform of unloading though, and we learned this from the PROTECT2 trial and other studies with the Impella device, that actually you can start to do things now that you couldn't do otherwise. And in fact, giving things like vasodilators, giving things like, for example, beta blockers, as you saw in the illustrated case, those are now all possible. Whereas if you didn't have the pump in place, you couldn't actually do that. So the pump itself will unload the ventricle. And as we start to see across the spectrum of blood pressures, the patients who are in the lower register of that you know, 100 to 130 range still get a substantial amount of unloading. And we can see that on the tracing, as you saw, the pulse amplitude started to narrow on the aortic tracing and the LVDP comes down. The second thing is that when we start to see the hypertensive patients, we would recommend treating the hypertension. And so that's where giving something like nitroglycerin or a vasodilator uh, in a, in, as an adjunct and you can do that in the control arm too, but you'd have to be careful about hypotension without a pump in place. So those are some important aspects of door to unload is, and there are hemodynamic parameters or targets to achieve in the unloaded arm, uh, you know, getting a map of about 80, heart rate of 80. Those are sort of targets that are recommended. I presume the EDP is as important. The EDP also is as critical, right? But we, we want to continuously monitor the EDP. But your question also brings up sort of the next phase for the door to loan concept. Let's say we complete the pivotal, we show it's safe, it's feasible, and we show for the first time that you can uncouple ischemia and reperfusion time. Every single drug that's been attempted in cardioprotection has been given at the time of reperfusion or immediately after. But now all of a sudden, if you had 30 minutes where you could do something else, imagine if you could give supersaturated oxygen. Imagine if you could give cyclosporin or bendavia or some of the other cardioprotective agents, and it had time to actually get to target as opposed to giving it in a rushed manner and then unleashing reperfusion injury before drug gets to target. So I think the just overall the platform of the DTU concept opens up a huge area of investigation going down the line. Yeah. That was a great talk. Uh, I, um, you know, the, the pump that you're talking about is a little bit different, but a lot of this stuff had been investigated and looked at in cardiac surgery decades ago. You know, we had shifted from this idea of cardioplegia, just stopping the heart, to myocardial protection. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the concepts that you're talking about are part of that, you know, and loading the heart, as you said, you know, you uh, the first thing that we train to do is to go on cardiopulmonary bypass and unload the heart. But in addition to doing that, uh, you know, Jerry Buckberg showed this whole idea of controlled reperfusion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after you, you know, when you unload the heart, uh, and then when you go and reperfuse it, either with PCI or with a with a cabbage, that how you allow that myocardium to recover the reperfusion and prevent the reperfusion injury involves more than just getting blood flow back to it, and more than unloading it. Things like uh, controlling the calcium load, the pressure load, the pH. Uh, so, I mean, are those things that, that you've started to think about to put into this? Yeah, so we certainly, we have started to do all of that. And in fact, the metabolomics work was some of the early uh, signals that started to point at the shift in calcium handling and pH, and that's the mitochondrial permeability pore, all of that. So I think, you know, to summarize it, going forward, it is possible that 10, 20 years from now, what we see is that in the cath lab, they replicate what's been done in ORs for decades. You go on pump and you administer a cardioplegic or protective agent that stabilizes the myocardium. And then when it's safe to do so, you open up that blocked artery. And in fact, I think that, you know, a lot of the premise and the principles were built out of the cardiac surgical OR, but now in the contemporary era, with the ability of doing this percutaneously. And it is a paradigm shift for the non-surgical community. But in fact, it's usually the surgical community that says, why did you rush to open the artery? And in fact, couldn't you have just waited longer? But that's not something we're gonna talk about now, <laughs> but it is something that we could start to talk about.
uh, in the future. And I think that's where surgical principles will start to enter the cath lab uh, yet again. Good morning. That was an excellent talk. Just a quick question. On your initial translational studies for ECMO, I know that it was a peripheral cannulation. Was there any thought of LV venting? Does that make a difference? What, yeah, what do you think? it's a great question, right? So the ECMO world, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, ECMO. And it's complicated. Uh, you know, I think that actually there's much more than just hemodynamic effects of ECMO. And in fact, in that preclinical work, as we started to look at the load effect, we were, our hypothesis was that ECMO would load, and this would be the explanation for the infarct expansion. But actually, when you look at the hemodynamic data, the ECMO itself actually didn't load, and it didn't really unload either, but it essentially kept the hemodynamic data quite neutral. But the infarct still expanded. And that's when we started to look at other potential re reasons for this. And as we said, one of them may be related to systemic immune activation uh, especially of neutrophils, uh, by going through this uh, this blood circuit, and that may be driving some of the infarct expansion. But is that significantly different from the tandem, the extracorp any extracorporeal pump you would think? Would do yeah, that, it, it is because remember you have an oxygenator so in place, and that starts to change the starts to change the milieu quite a bit. Yes. Now there's more science coming out about ECMO uh, from the lab, but the idea of venting would solve the hemodynamic problem if we thought that that is what's driving the infarct expansion but I think that's probably only one part of the equation. And one quick question too. So in the DTU, in the, in the feasibility study, was there a significant change in how much neurohormonal blockade patients got during the case? No, so no. I mean, for the, for the most part, actually, patients didn't really receive much. So the goal is hemodynamic targeting just to make sure that you don't have a hypertensive patient uh, on an impella in the trial but uh, is really to make sure the patients are normotensive is the goal. And, you know, future studies may start to look at the combination of beta blocker and impella, all that stuff, but that's not the, that's not the objective of the trial. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank, much. you. Thank you all. I want to remind you can go at 945, the live interview, you can submit more questions, um, and Naveen will be able to answer it. Thank you. Thanks, Naveen. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you.